Monty Hall asks you to choose one of three doors. One of the doors hides a prize and the other two, well they have nothing. You state out loud which door you want, but you don't open it right away. Monty then opens one of the other two doors and there is no prize behind it. At this moment there are two closed doors, one of which you have picked. The prize is behind one of them, but you don't know which one. Monty asks you, do you want to switch doors? The question of the Monty Hall problem, whilst looking simple, is a bit baffling in reality. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought suggests that there is a 50-50 chance the prize is behind the door, so it doesn't really matter if you switch or not. The other school of thought suggests that there is a 66% chance of you getting the correct door if you switch due to there being three doors originally and assuming the open door is still accountable within the problem. Now, the question of do you switch doors is much more tricky, isn't it? Let's look at this mathematically. For the 50-50 school of thought, we disregard the open door as you've not picked it and there's nothing behind it, so... Fuck it. For the 6% school of thought, however, we keep the third door within the equation, leading to a change. This change means changing doors is more statistically viable. The question in the middle of the two schools of thought, however, is do we disregard the empty door? On one hand, it is viable data, as to begin with, you were just as likely to pick that door as you were the other two, a 33% chance to be precise. However, is it really viable when the value of the door is zero and you can't choose that door now? If the option of the third door is removed, can you still consider it viable in the statistical equation being carried out? Now, which school of thought is considered right, I hear you ask? Well, here's the funny thing, buckaroos. There was some research performed by Paul Edros, a noted mathematician, observing a computer simulation. Here are the results. Look at them sexy results. As can be seen from these results, the computer ended up with a 66% win rate when switching doors, meaning it's statistically viable to include the third door within the statistical calculations, and everyone who says it's 50-50 can suck a dick. I'm kidding, of course. However, next time you're on a game show and you want to win immediately by making the host cry in the corner, maybe you should ask him to pick a door. And maybe he'll pick the wrong door. There are 12 men on an island. 11 weigh exactly the same, but one of them is slightly heavier. You must figure out which. The island, of course, has no scales, but there is a seesaw. The exciting catch. You can only use it three times. The 12 men question is a difficult one to say the least. 11 of these men weigh the same with one man weighing more than the rest. The kids would say we are of an imposter here. <laughs> I would say it's a fun brain teaser. But how do you actually solve it? Well, most people decide to split it up. Six men on each side, then three and then a... You've used up all your turns and chances are, statistically speaking, you haven't found the answer. So, what about splitting the men up into three equal groups of four? Well, based on probability, if you find the pair which are affecting the weight before you run out of seesaw, then yeah, it is a solution. However, the probability of that is rather low. One in 12, to be precise. We don't want a solution based on luck. We want some hard math and science. It's like drugs, only way less cool. So, solution. It's very mathematical indeed and does not rely on chance. However, there is a very small margin of failure. To begin with, let's number our island men from 1 to 12. There we go. Lovely. I like man number 7, personally. However, let's not get sidetracked. You then tell 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and of course 8 to get on the seesaw. If the seesaw moves in one direction, you can then tell the four people on the side that moved to repeat the action in twos and then in ones and you have an answer. However, if the seesaw doesn't move, we then move to 1, 2 and 3 against 9, 10 and 11. 1, 2 and 3 being our safety nets. If it moves, we can weigh 9 against 10, see there's a difference, however that is our margin of failure. However, if there isn't a difference and the seesaw does not move, we can say man 12 is the heaviest man, and we can place him on the seesaw one last time with any other man to prove our hypothesis. 
and that rather long and convoluted explanation does indeed tell us how to solve the 12 men problem. So maybe next time you want to ruin a family dinner, make Grandad cry and Grandma wish you'd put her in a care home, ask them about 12 men and a seesaw. Now, before we start, the title is of course a joke. Shadow Square is a veggie boy, mostly for personal beliefs and partially to ensure that plants don't rise up and kill us all, because that's a thought that keeps me awake in the night. Anyway, chickens are fun and tasty, right? And hens? Hens are cool too. What's the coolest thing a hen does? If you said lay eggs, you're right. Now it does take time, of course. On average, a hen lays an egg a day. Pretty cool. The horny bastards. Now, what about these hens? A hen and a half lays an egg and a half in a day and a half. How many eggs does one hen lay in one day? Now, this may be confusing, but let's break it down. 1.5 hens lay 1.5 eggs in 1.5 days. How many does one hen lay in one day? From a research, you'd say one. Well, you're wrong. These hens are both lazy and imaginary. So you should book up your ideas and use math. My least favorite thing. Let me show you how it's done. If 1.5 hens lay 1.5 eggs in 1.5 days, one hen would lay one egg in the same amount of time, 1.5 days. Now, if one hen lays one egg in 1.5 days, using division, it means that one hen would lay two thirds of an egg in a day. So the answer is two thirds of an egg. Now, you may say, oh shadows where you handsome, handsome man. If the hen only lays two thirds of an egg in a day, then it hasn't actually laid an egg. And this is the wrong answer. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong. And I'm also not saying Anon's wrong, because I asked him and he also said that, and he scares me. However, what I am saying is this is a mathematical question, not based in the real world, because who can own one and a half hens? And why would they lay an egg and a half in a one and a half days? And why is it so damn specific? This is just a fun math problem. And if I see any of you sick fucks in the comments tell me about this one time where you cut a hen in half, I swear to Jesus you will not live to see the end of this day. So there you have it. If you ever want to ruin your divorce court hearing and lose custody of your children, maybe ask the judge about one and a half hens. Granny's moved house to get away from your annoying and slightly perverted uncle who keeps stealing her pillows. Oh no. In her rush, she's left all of her stuff in her attic. To avoid returning, she tells you that whatever is up there is yours. That's great, right? You can get some knickknacks and pawn them off at a cheap rate. By doing this, you're making yourself some money, but you're also a monster. How dare you pawn off the stuff your gran has given you, you bastard. So, you rummage about in the attic, and you find five short chains, each made up of four golden links. You're super cool, and realise if you combine them all into one big loop, you'd have an incredible necklace. So. You bring it to a jeweler, who tells you that the cost of making the necklace will be ten dollar dues for each golden link that she has to break and then reseal. So this begs the question, how much is Granny going to suck out of your pocket so you can look cool? Uh, I'll give you ten seconds to figure this out whilst I strangle Grandma for being a leech. Now that Grandma is dead, let's work this one out, shall we? The most straightforward answer would be to break a link on the end of each of the five chains, quite like how I snapped Grandmother's neck. Then reattach the links back onto the next chain in the loop. This would cost you 50 buckaroos for the five links that were broken and resealed and bang, you have your necklace. But is there a better way? Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, there is, of course there is, I wouldn't be asking otherwise. Now, you have five chains, right? So, instead of breaking the ends of each of the five chains, break all of the links on one, leaving you with four linkable pieces and four chains. Then you link the four chains together with the four pieces and bang, you have your big ass chain and it only cost you 40 big ones, which is like 3,091.19 Dominican pesos, which is fun. And on top of that, you've saved yourself a good 10 round boys, which you can spend on whatever you like. 
I myself shall be spending it in prison, because I just committed first degree murder. So, if you're trying to make a deal with a rather corrupt but kind of nice prosecutor to commute your sentence because you will sleep with him and you want to break the ice, maybe ask him about grandma's golden chain. Would you look at that? You've done it. You've just finished building the most useless thing in all the world. The American rail system. 4,000 miles of handrails, why? Who gives a shit? You fucking did it. You've opened it up to all of your friends and hopefully you'll be invited to one of your friends' super not sketchy island for a party. However, your assistant Jane has only just informed you that the metal you used actually expands by an inch in the summer months due to heat meaning it will be a little bit longer than 4,000 miles, but you don't care, it's time to party with Jeffrey. However, this is of course a bigger deal than you believe, because the handrail is secured best at the start and the end, leaving the middle as a weak point, and as it gets hotter, due to enlargement, the rail will buckle and rise like a weird omen from the gods. And the question remains, how much higher will the pedestrians in the middle of the country have to reach in the summer to grab the handrail? Now, this is of course very mathematical, so I'll give you some time while the police raid this arsehole's party. Let's say... 10 seconds. Now that he's going down for many, many grimes, let's work this out. The rail buckling in the middle would create a triangle-like shape. Very nice. And either side of the triangle would have a length. The halfway mark upon the ground would be one side of our triangle, the height from the beginning to the middle would be another, and our final side we can label H as our unknown. Converting to inches, including rounding, will make our lives a lot easier. So, rounding up, one side would be 27 million inches long, and the side which expands would be 27.5 million inches long. We can use Pythagoras' theorem to state a squared plus b squared of course equals c squared, which we can convert into the formula 27 million squared plus h equals 20 million point five squared. Now doing the math on the screen, we can determine that the height on the bar will be 11,260 inches, or 938 feet. Which, you know, no one in their right mind could ever fucking reach. So next time you want to bail out to a very illegal party run by the world's biggest nonce, maybe ask yourself about the American handrail system. <laughs>